Well, hello everybody. I have not recorded a YouTube video in quite some time. Uh, this is going to cover period 6, 1868-1898. I'm going to look at Gilded Age presidents. Uh, specifically, I'm going to cover the elections of 1876, 1880, 1884, 1888, 1882. Now that might sound like, oh my goodness, Mr. Lenhart, please. Are you going to go five hours? No, 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 no. I'm only going to go three and a half. Don't worry. It won't be any longer than three and a half hours. Now, in all honesty, I'm just going to cover some very brief things that I think are kind of important, also kind of funny. Uh, these elections of the Gilded Age, uh, of these various presidents, who I collectively, yes, uh, I don't mean to offend anybody when I say it, but I often call them the craptacular presidents of the United States. They just, uh, um, they're, pretty, uh, they're pretty interesting, sometimes in not so good ways, but uh, it, there's just two concepts, really, that cover uh, some of this. Although some of the concepts that will go through period six, we can apply here or there. But the two in particular I'm going to look at right now. Uh, so here, uh, key concept 6-1, Roman numeral 2. Uh, again, letter A, they're laissez-faire policies. We talked about this in class, this hands-off or leave-it-alone policy that the federal government runs during this time period. Uh, it could be argued that since George Washington's time period, the government has not really been involved in the economy. It's, uh, there's, there, there's some moments here or there, though, where you can honestly say, well, the, the government got somewhat involved in economic situations. Oh, and by the way, from time to time, I will be taking sips of my Starbucks iced caramel macchiato, venti. I should get money for that. I don't know. Ah, oh, that was good. Um, but we talked about this again. Let's focus again here on laissez-faire policies. The idea that the government does not get involved in economic issues. It allows for big business uh, to basically take over. Uh, they feel like this is the best way to get competition and promote economic growth. And uh, even during these economic downturns that we talked about in class, and we'll get into here the Panic of 1873, which we've already touched upon. Uh, but it's interesting, especially we're going to get the Republican Party now. This party of Lincoln, uh, it's, when we think of the Republican Party, we have to kind of remember something actually very important. As the Republicans were formed in the 1850s, they were basically became two separate types of Republicans. You had those Henry Clay Whigs, right? The American system, pro-business, pro-bank, pro-protective tariff. And that is the main part of that Republican Party. But they were also against the expansion of slavery. They weren't against slavery itself. They simply did not want it to expand west. Then you had those abolitionists, those who do want to end slavery, who are more reformed-minded. They joined the Republican Party because they couldn't join the Democrats because the Gem Democrats embraced slavery. So they joined the Republican Party. They, they had at least one common thing, stop the spread of slavery west. Within these radical Republicans, hope to eventually influence the entire party to help end slavery. Well, we know what happens. Lincoln, who's a moderate, is elected in 1860. That starts the whole process of civil war, la, 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 la. We get to Reconstruction. And those radicals are able to get the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments passed. Right? Ending slavery, giving citizenship, and the right to vote in that order. But what begins to happen now as we get Ulysses S. Grant president in 1868 and again in 1872? Right? And I love these political cartoons. You're going to see a lot of political cartoons. In fact, throughout much of the slide, you're going to see mostly cartoons. This is entitled Grantism. Remember, he's involved in all these scandals of the time period. And these are various men within his administration that have been caught in scandals. And here's Grant trying to hold up, you know, government. <laughs> and it doesn't look very easy for him if you think about it. 
Well, we get a first big test of Republican principles in the Panic of 1873, this major economic downturn, as our concepts call them. It starts within the railroads, especially the Baltimore, Ohio, the B&O, on your Monopoly board there. By 1877, you get a great railroad strike, which we also talked about today. Uh, but the main problem here is, well, how is the government going to react, right? Generally speaking, they don't do anything, but it's not actually true. Uh, the government does get involved in some ways. In fact, we'll show it right now. One of the things that Republicans begin to believe in is what they call hard money principle or gold, right? Gold is a commodity. It's something I can weigh. It's something I can hold in my hands. I can actually attach a real value to it. Unlike fiat money, or fiat is Latin for by law, which is paper money. During the Civil War, you may or may not remember that they began to print greenbacks. I have the word down here, greenback dollars. Um, they were based mostly on the credit of the government as they won battles, the greenback was worth something. As they lost battles, the greenback wasn't worth, worth much. But the, a lot of them stayed into circulation after the war. People were still using them. And this could be one of the causes of the panic. There's also another precious metal out there known as silver. Silver is not worth as much as gold. Uh, on a world uh, exchange rate, it was 32 ounces to one ounce of gold. 32 ounces of silver would equal one ounce of gold. But the United States was a little different. They made it 16 ounces to one. 16 ounces of silver would equal one ounce of gold. Thereby, silver dollars were bigger than gold dollar pieces. That 16 to one is something we're going to talk a lot about over the coming weeks, and especially, hey, I'm going to say the joke again, next year. Uh, well, at this moment, the government decided to react. The first thing they did after this panic hit is they passed the Coinage Act of 1873. They will no longer mint silver coins. They're going to take silver out of circulation. They believe that only using gold is what's going to help save the economy. This moment, a group of Americans who, well, they're farmers. The farmers of Americans are going to react with great anger over this. Farmers, they don't get, they can't get their hands as easily on money as everybody else can. Silver was very important to them. They saw this as the crime of 73. And this is going to start the farmer rebellion that will eventually culminate in 1896, which is another lesson we're not going to get into that here, but that's where it begins with the crime of 73. See, farmers and debtors, they believe in what we call inflationary policy. They want to inflate the monetary system. Not only have gold, but have a lot of silver and a lot of paper dollars. When you inflate, think of a balloon. I take a balloon and I blow it up. It inflates it. So I create more of something. You actually wind up devaluing the dollar. And this is what farmers, debtors, and to some smaller extent, some Democrats would like to see. More inflationary policy. Devalue the dollar. The thought is it would cut your debts in half. I mean, we're going to talk a lot about this. It doesn't make sense a lot, but a lot of people believe this. The Republicans at the time want to practice what they call contraction or deflationary policy. They want to take money out of the system. Now, again, I know that's sometimes not always easy to understand what I'm saying here. So I have a question here on the video log for you. Explain the two points. Why did the federal government stop mining silver? They want deflationary policy is what they're looking for here. They, they want to cut the circulation of money in half. Thereby, they're going to make the dollar stronger. They passed the Redemption Act of 1875 afterwards. What the Redemption Act is going to say, we have, let's say, it's, I think it's somewhere around $400 million worth of greenback, paper dollars in circulation. Once we get rid of silver, once we begin to contract or deflate the monetary system, eventually that dollar will start to 
be worth a dollar. And at a certain time in 1879, they'll give it four years, you can then take your greenbacks and redeem them in gold. We'll make the paper money equal to gold. We'll no longer go with fiat. We'll no longer go with this by law nonsense. And we'll make the paper dollar actually worth a dollar of gold. It worked so well that by 1879, most people would rather keep their paper dollars. So long as they knew the paper was actually worth the value of gold, one dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever paper note you had could be redeemed in gold now. Contraction worked in 1873 through 1879. I'm not saying that it would work all the time. I'm just saying it worked at this time. All right? Uh, the, again, your second question on this is why did the farmers refer to this as the crime of 73? They want inflationary policy. They actually want to inflate the monetary system because they truly are going to believe, and like I said, we're going to talk a lot about this later on in class, that it will help them with their debts, that they want bimetallism. They want silver and gold in the system. And they got very angry when the government, what they thought, basically backstabbed them by taking the silver out. All right. Again, if that's confusing, play it back. We can also look in our textbook. Uh, you can look at Wikipedia if that helps too. I don't, I don't know. But uh, so I'm trying to basically not spend the three hours on here and just give you a quick overview of these things. So let's move on. Here is the concept where much of this really falls under 6.3, key concept 6.3, 6 Roman numeral 2, letter A. It says the majority political parties, the major political parties, I'm sorry, appealed to the lingering divisions from the Civil War. America still had a lot of divisions. What is going to happen is the Republicans are going to take advantage of this. The Democrats are going to hurt for quite a while. Remember, the Democratic Party basically became the Confederacy. They're going to have a few decades here where they're going to have to try and reinvent themselves and figure out how to get back into the good gracious of America, into the good graciousness of Americans. Sorry, I'm taking another sip. Mm, man, that's good stuff. It's iced. That's even better. All right. Now, here's this ugly word again. Tariffs. Ooh, it just never seems to go away. But it's going to be a different type of fight now than it was pre-Civil War. If you remember pre-Civil War, remember we're working on synthesis here. How do you connect something to different time periods? Pre-Civil War, Southern states, states' rights issue, compact theory, they felt that the tariff violated Southern autonomy. It violated their rights. Um, it raised their taxes without any input on this. And they would always equate that then, if you can raise my taxes without asking, then you can eventually take away my slaves, right? If you raise my taxes, you'll take away my slaves. Now we're beyond that, but tariff is still going to be an issue because during the Civil War, they will raise taxes to protect industry. The Republicans, what did I say earlier? The majority of Republicans are descendants of Henry Clay and the Whig Party protective tariff industry. We're getting ready to go into an industrial revolution. Tariffs become important to big business, to capitalism, and thereby the Republican Party. Currency issues, I just really talked about that with the crime of 73. That also is part of this, um, this key concept as well. We'll talk about some other currency issues throughout the course of the year, uh, this particular time period especially. Um, and we'd start to see corruption at all levels of government. After the Civil War, the radical element uh, will eventually literally die away. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens, uh, Charles Sumner, leaders of the radical Republicans, you know, they will pass away. And eventually the Republican Party becomes split between two groups, two factions within the Republican Party. You have these stalwart uh, Republicans and half-breeds. Stalworth Republicans, uh, to stay stalwart, to stand still, to stand strong, to not to be unmovable. The idea that we've got to stay loyal to Lincoln. We've got to stay loyal to Ulysses S. Grant, no matter what. No matter how much corruption come our way, 
We have to stay loyal to that part of the party. The other thing is this idea of party patronage. We mentioned this way back in Thomas Jefferson's day. We, we touched on it too with Andrew Jackson. In order to help win elections, you had to have people at the local level working hard for you. If you won an election then, in order to say thank you, I'll never, I am never going to meet you probably, but I can give you a government job, a party patronage. Uh, stalwarts really love party patronage and they want to keep that going. Uh, they win a lot of elections, Republicans, doing this thing called waving the bloody shirt. How do you beat Democrats in elections? You constantly remind the voting public that the Republican Party was the Union Army, that Democrats were the Confederates. Oftentimes you would literally have a shirt that you would claim was from a dead Union soldier, hence the term waving the bloody shirt. That helped win elections. Men who worked hard at the local level waving the bloody shirt would then want a party patronage job. And the stalwarts wanted to keep that going. The half-breed Republicans. I'm not exactly 100% sure how that name came, but basically it's this idea that they felt the country was changing. Industrialism is coming. We've got to kind of move away from the old school Lincoln, Grant, Republicans and come into a new era of industrialization. Thereby, they want to reform some stuff. One thing they want to do is reform party patronage. They think it's getting out of hand. Uh, they would like to create what they call a civil service act. Instead of just giving jobs away for helping, you've got to take an exam. You've got to pass a test and show that you actually deserve such job. But in any case, both sides of Republicans are more concerned over economic growth and they're not concerned over civil rights anymore. This is totally seen then in the election of 1876. The Republicans... Well, they want to nominate this James Blaine guy. James Blaine is the head of the half-breeds. But James Blaine from Maine rhymes, I know, not the most honest guy. Uh, they're going to discover some letters. It's called the Mulligan Letters, where he may or may not have been involved in some corrupt scandals with railroads. He may have been involved in corrupt scandals, for instance, with Credit Mobilier, if you remember that. He will deny, 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 deny. They'll produce these letters written to a Mr. Mulligan. In fact, Mr. Mulligan himself comes to Congress to produce these letters saying that James Blaine was part of some of this stuff. The one thing that was really damaging is at the end of one particular letter James Blaine wrote to Mr. Mulligan, it said, burn this letter. That is going to haunt James Blaine for a long time. In fact, I'm mentioning his name because we're going to talk about him later on because he will run for president later. So Republicans can't nominate him. They nominate Rutherford B. Hayes, a general in the Civil War and a pretty liked guy. The Democrats nominate a Samuel Tilden. And in this election, the popular vote went to Samuel Tilden. Uh, I, I know that sounds strange. We would never get an election where somebody wins a popular vote and they still don't become president. I mean, that's just, that's, that's just, that's just crazy. It's crazy. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, what happens is uh, there's some disputed votes in the state of Florida. Yes, I say the state of Florida had some disputed electoral votes. Instead of trying to do recounts and all that kind of stuff, the Republicans sat down with the Democrats and they offered them a deal. Let Rutherford B. Hayes be president and they will officially begin to end Reconstruction. Home rule will begin in the South. The Democratic Party can take back the Southern states. Republicans and the, and the federal army will leave. This is often called corrupt bargain part two. This one really though is a corrupt bargain. The first one, again, synthesis, if you were to compare, that was Andrew Jackson losing the popular vote to John Quincy Adams, and yet John, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Andrew Jackson winning the popular vote 
And yet John Quincy Adams became president because supposedly of a corrupt bargain with Henry Clay. Mm, can't really prove that's a corrupt bargain, but this one here, you definitely can. So Rutherford B. Hayes is president because the Republicans begged the Democrats to basically give them the votes. And in turn, you would end Reconstruction and allow home rule. Democrats would get home rule of the southern states all over again. And again, political cartoons. I've mentioned them several times. There's Thomas Nast. That's the ballot box. And they're all kicking it about instead of actually doing what's right. And they're just kind of playing soccer with it and seeing, well, how can we get it to fix it so that Rutherford B. Hayes is president? All right. A lot of more car uh, cartoons and pictures now. Fast forward to the election of 1880, because I don't really care much about what took place in any of these presidents' uh, term of office. I just like their elections. Again, the half-breeds and Republicans are fighting each other terribly. They're starting to realize that by 1880, remember, the Civil War ended in 1865. So here we are 15 years later. You can't keep waving the bloody shirt. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be able to help you win elections forever. The half-breeds, again, are led by James Blaine of Maine. The stalwarts are led by Roscoe Conkling of New York. These two men, I cannot even express it enough, absolutely hate each other, cannot stand each other. But again, no one will let Blaine be president because he may or may not be corrupt. So they come up with a compromise. The Republicans compromise. This is a Republican compromise on James Garfield. Now, interestingly, he is a half-breed Republican. The compromise then is the vice president, Chester Arthur, is a stalwart. So you'll have a half-breed Republican running for president with a vice president who's a stalwart. Two very interesting facts here. Trivia, trivia, actually. Two very interesting trivia things, okay? Garfield becomes our only president to win an election while serving in the House of Representatives. No one in the House of Representatives has ever been able to successfully run a candidacy for president and win because nobody knows who you are when you're in the House of Representatives. But because the Republicans put all their support behind him, he wins. Chester Arthur, look at those mutton chops. He is a man who just a few months earlier all right. Just a few months earlier, he was the head of the custom houses of New York City. A custom house is where we talk about tariffs. When you put tariffs on all these imported goods, all that money goes through your custom houses, your duty houses. He was in charge of that in New York City. Turned out there was a lot of corruption there. A lot of money went missing. President Rutherford B. Hayes officially fired him from his post. He becomes the only man in history to be fired by a president of the United States for supposed corruption, to get elected vice president, and, well, he's going to become president. Unfortunately for James Garfield, he will now be our second president of the United States to be assassinated. Why? Remember I was talking to you about party patronage. That's important. People want jobs. I worked hard. I waved a bloody shirt. I got my local parish. I got my local district. I got my local county to vote for you. And you became president. You need to give me a job. One such guy was a guy named Charles Gateau, who I'm going to give you an interesting article to read when we're in class again called The Lunatic and the President, because he does claim insanity as his defense. He went to Washington looking for a job. No one knows who this guy is, and they made him leave. He went and bought a gun. He began to stalk the president, and he waited for a right moment. The president is about to go on a summer vacation, the summer of 1881. He's standing in a train station when Coteau came up behind him and shot him twice in the back. As he's being taken away, he yells out, I am a stalwart, and Arthur is president now. He thinks this is going to get him a job. Awesome. Poor James Garfield, too. He's not going to die immediately. In fact, he probably would have lived 
if he didn't have doctors. <laughs> the doctors come. They begin to poke their fingers in his back looking for the bullet. They can't find him. A good friend is Alexander Graham Bell, who has invented a metal detector, comes to the White House trying to find the bullets. He thinks he picks up where the bullets are. The doctors roll Gar uh, uh, Garfield over. They open them up looking for the bullets, can't find the bullets, sew them back up. Bell comes back a second time trying to find the bullets. He thinks he finds the bullets with his metal detectors. They open them up again, can't find the bullets. And eventually, you know, disease sets in and Garfield dies. Yeah, not a good thing to have doctors in this time period, I, I, I do believe. Um, and poor Alexander Graham Bell. They would discover later on that it was the steel springs in the bed that he was picking up on his metal detector. Charles Guiteau will go on trial. He'll claim insanity. Um, we, they did not allow the, the insanity offense, uh, defense to work for him, and he will be sentenced to death. Like I said, I'm going to give you it's a pretty funny, interesting article that we'll, we'll look at in class the next, the next time we're together. But what happens from this assassination is also very interesting. Remember, Arthur is a stalwart. Stalwarts like party patronage. They don't want it to go away. Arthur now betrays the stalwarts and he gets he decides a president has died because of this so he begins to support the civil service reform bill making these patronage jobs these jobs within the federal government post office tax collector uh, whatever it is all these various government jobs will now be entrance exams you've got to take an exam and prove you're capable to do the job we're not going to use them anymore to give you party favors. This makes Stalwarts very angry at Arthur, and he's not really going to be able to run for re-election in 1884. But what we didn't know is he was also secretively sick. He was dying of kidney disease, what at the time was called Bright's disease. Here's a political cartoon of Charles Gateau, an office or your life, right? Well, let's talk now about the election of 1884. The Democrats finally win one. James Blaine, I keep talking about him. He didn't want to run for president in 84. He wanted to run for president in 1876, but the Mulligan letters sank him. In 1884, this is eight years later, he would rather General William Tecumseh Sherman run. He actually begs him to run, but Sherman realized that politics is just not for him whatsoever, and he refuses. So Blaine decides, all right, I will finally run for president. He does get the nominee for president of the United States. A group of Republicans decide there's no way we can vote for this corrupt man. And they will break away from the Republican Party. They become known as mugwomps. I don't have the word up there. I'm not sure I really need you to know that, but they're called mugwomps. Uh, it's an old Indian word that kind of means self-righteous. Some people also say it's like putting your mug on one side of a fence and your womp or your butt on the other because they're Republicans, but they're going to vote Democrat. They're going to vote against James Blaine. So this is James Blaine dressed up like Little Bo Peep. He's lost his sheep, his mugwomps, and he's trying to get them back in the Republican Party. One of the mugwomps, by the way, is a young, and you can see the Back here in the picture, maybe you can take that out, Theodore Roosevelt. Although Theodore Roosevelt is going to claim that he never was going to be a mugwomp, he kind of, they claim that he said uh, that he felt this was a disgrace and that any good Democrat that came along, he would have to vote for him. He claimed he didn't say that, but then he winds up saying, well, if I did say it, I said it under duress. So he might have said that. We, we're not really 100% sure. Yes, Theodore Roosevelt's on the scene now, people. But this opened the door for Grover Cleveland, Grover the Good. Actually, his name is Stephen Grover uh, Cleveland, but he liked Grover better. Grover the Good, he, he was considered one of the most honest persons around. He was, a, he was a Buffalo lawyer who eventually became the mayor of Buffalo, and then he became the governor of New York. He was the governor for a little more than a year, when they nominated him for president. 
He believes in classical liberalism. That meant Thomas Jefferson liberalism. Small government. Government stays out of the economy. Government does not um, pay for infrastructure like the Republicans were doing. This is what's going to get him elected. However, he's Grover the Good. James Blaine of Maine is a liar, right? The Mulligan letters. He had that one letter where at the bottom it says, burn this letter. At all these different rallies where he would go give talks, Democrats would, sh would show up and they would start chanting, burn, burn, burn this letter, burn, burn, burn this letter. Well, they found out something bad about Grover the Good. Turns out Grover the Good may have fathered an illegitimate child. <gasps> no! Yes. A Maria Halpin comes forward and claims that she had an illegitimate, an illegitimate child with Grover Cleveland. How could Grover the Good have done this? See his little tag down there says, Grover the good, no way. And the little baby's, I want my paw. And he's putting his finger in his ear. No, what have I done? What have I done? Well, even though the Republicans begin to claim this, and they get a couple of people to actually print some very, very specific lies about it, the Democrats go to Grover and ask him to do the gentlemanly thing and to just lie. He says, I'm Grover the Good. I can't lie. I'm going to tell the truth. And it turns out it was the best thing to do. He tells basically a story, and I'm just paraphrasing a lot of this. He was in a business practice with his best friend, Oscar Folsom. Miss uh, Halpin was a widower who wasn't getting her husband's pension. The two of them, as lawyers, on their behalf, help her win her case. Both of them wound up having relationships with her. Turns out Maria would later go on to say she had relationships with a lot of guys and she wasn't exactly sure who the father was. Grover was pretty sure it was Oscars. In fact, in the beginning when she first said that she was pregnant, she claimed it was Oscars. But Oscar was a married man. Grover Cleveland is a bachelor. He's not married. He's going to protect the reputation of his best friend and he said, I will pay for the child which he begins to pay a week, a monthly salary to help raise the child. By the way, by the time he's running for president, this was no longer a baby. Uh, I believe he was somewhere between 10 and 12 years of age by now. Oscar had passed away. In the meantime, he had died in an accident. And not only was Grover Cleveland taking care of an illegitimate child, Maria had a nervous breakdown and had to be sent to an insane asylum he was also paying for her. At the same time, his best friend Oscar dies. He begins to pay for his the widow of his friend Oscar, Mrs. Folsom, and they had a young daughter, Frances, and he began to put money aside for her college education. He is Grover the Good. Americans went, that is so sweet. Oh my God, that's awesome. There is nothing James Blaine the liar from Maine could ever do to overcome this. They tried to come back with slogans like, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? And the Democrats would say, go into the White House, ha, ha, ha. And Grover Cleveland wins the election of 1884. Whoops, here we go. But it didn't turn out as good for him as he thought it would. He's Grover the good. He's also Grover the veto. Um, 400 and 400 plus vetoes, I forget the exact number, his first term in office alone. Oh, we Everyone got mad that Andrew Jackson vetoed 12 times. This man vetoed the first four years over 400 times. His most famous veto is the Texas Seed Bill. A massive drought hit Texas, and the farmers of Texas were desperate for help. Congress raised $10,000, $10,000, that's all it was, to send to the farmers of Texas. He vetoed it. And he has a very famous quote in it where he said, people support the government. The government does not support the people. <clears throat> that's a Democrat. 
People support the government. The government does not support the people. That, again, is classical liberalism, but people are starting to get tired of the fact that all he does is veto. As the election of 88 comes around, <coughs> excuse me, I'm take a sip. Ah. He decides to get involved in tariff issues. He had no idea what tariffs really were, and he begins to study tariffs. He begins to notice that the tariffs since the Civil War keep going up, keep going up, keep going up. And he begins to realize this might not be good for consumers. As the tariff on the tax on an imported good goes up, so do all consumer products. The price of them goes up. If you lower the tariffs, prices of consumer goods would go down, plus you would encourage trade with the world. Oh my goodness, trade with the world. So he will run for re-election on the promise of lowering the tariffs, which infuriates the Republican Party and they will basically buy the election of 1888. They're gonna nominate this tiny little guy right here. Yeah, hey little guy, how you doing? That's Benjamin Harrison, the grandson of William Henry Harrison, who was a president for about two days or something like that. You know, he's the guy that died in office really quickly. This is his grandson. He really wasn't that big, he was a little smaller. You know, this is Uncle Sam looking under the microscope. I love political cartoons of the time period. You know, they're saying basically Benjamin Harrison is a non-entity. He is a Republican that the Republican Party simply said, tag, you're it. And getting with big business who did not want to lower the tariffs because they want to protect industry, they will buy the election of 1888. They will pay for what's called floaters and repeaters. Men who will go from county to county and some in some situations state to state and vote a second, third, and fourth time. and Or repeat. Some men will simply go in line. This is going to sound funny, but I'll stand in line with a giant beard and I'll vote. Then I'll go out and I'll trim my beard down. I'll come in. I'll vote. Then I'll shave my beard off and have a big old mustache. I'll go in and vote. Then I'll shave off my mustache. I'll go in and vote again. So you had floaters and repeaters and they were paying for this. They also went to industry, and industry told their workers, if Grover Cleveland wins, you lose a job. And this is how Benjamin Harrison becomes our president of the United States, 1888. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you an interesting story. Grover Cleveland was a bachelor when he got elected in 1884. Then it turned out that he's going to get engaged. He's going to get married. He's going to marry Miss Folsom. And everyone was very excited. He's going to marry the wife, or, uh, the, the widow of his best friend, Oscar. And it's like, no, I'm not marrying her. I'm marrying her daughter. Let me put that to you again. He married the daughter, Frances Folsom. She was 21 and he was 47. Uh, but she actually fell in love with him and did as much pursuing as he did of her. Uh, it's crazy. At uh, first, Americans were like, well, wait, wait, what, what, what? But then Americans fell in love with Frances Folsom. I mean, they absolutely fell in love with this young girl. Uh, she became our first, like, superstar first lady, Frances Folsom. Uh, he becomes our only president to date to get married in the White House. They start having children, including a baby Ruth. That might sound familiar to you. Uh, ask me about baby Ruth candy bars later on, and I'll tell you the real story behind that. When they were leaving the White House after they lost in 88, Francis looked at the movers and said, don't scratch anything, we'll be back. And she's right. Remember, Grover Cleveland is our only two non-consecutive term president because they got this guy as president. Hey, little guy. Hey, little guy, how you doing? Yeah, coochie coochie. Ooh, Benjamin Harrison, non-entity. They always like to draw him in a giant big hat and he would get shorter and shorter and shorter. And towards the end of his presidency, some artists would just j draw the big hat as though he didn't even exist anymore. Well, with the win of the election of 1888, the Republicans are totally in control. They decide it's time to jack up those tariffs. And in 1890, we get the McKinley tariff, which raises the tariff up to 50%. 
This country becomes very wealthy because of this. A massive surplus for the first time in history, you're going to have what's called the Billion Dollar Congress. And they're not going to know what to do. When Grover Cleveland was president, I told you, he vetoed over 400 times, most of which were Civil War veteran pensions. He felt like he couldn't prove who was in the Civil War or not, and he vetoed their pensions all the time. Congress is now going to make it rain on Civil War veterans. 1890, we're 30 years almost from the Civil War. Some of these men are 60, 70, 80 years old, and they're going to give them $10,000, $15,000, which is a stink load of money in our time period. Uh, they don't know what to do. But Americans really got angry over this, raising the tariff 50%, having all this money. The Republicans seem out of control. Benjamin Harrison is just a tiny little weevil of an elf of a guy. And people are like, you know what? Maybe we want Grover Cleveland back. And that's what they got. Part two, 1892. There's Grover Cleveland, the mustache, Don Juan, and there's Benjamin Harrison. Look, he can't even smile. He, 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 his spine is collapsing on him. He literally, I think, is shrinking. And Grover Cleveland wins his reelection by skipping a term. Uh, but it doesn't go well for Grover Cleveland, his second term. Americans were very happy to get him back in there. And then a great panic happens in 1893. I'm not going to talk to you about that panic um, at all. I'm going to do that in class. That's going to lead to that election, election of 1896 that I teased you about. That's the Wizard of Oz election. And so that will all be set up later on in class. Hopefully, I entertained you a little bit, and I spread some knowledge. That's what I'm hoping to do with this as well. But uh, that's it for this lecture. Don't forget, your video logs are on Edmodo. And I'll see everybody later in class. All righty. Have a good night. Bye.